Hey everyone, welcome to uh, a new kind of video that I'm trying out. I decided to do a ranking of the gritty fairy tale movies that I talked about. Um, I'm thinking I might do some rankings with this, but I thought it would be good to start with, you know, a list of movies that I've already talked about. Uh, if you happen to be watching this and it's the first video you've seen of, your ch of uh, this channel, uh, welcome first of all. And you should know there is a, we'll call it a companion video to this, or a video this is a companion to, is probably a better way to say it, where I look at the trend of gritty fairy tale movies from the 2010s. And I am going to be talking about all the same movies in this video, but it's going to be a bit more informal. Uh, that one that I put out is a lot more detailed and in-depth and I spent a lot more time in it. I'm going to be just kind of informally ranking these. Uh, I'm going to go bottom to top, those 12 movies. Kind of spoiler warning for them. They're all based on fairy tales that you already know, so like, I don't know that you should care that much about the spoiler warning. Yeah, we'll just kind of see how this goes. So, at the bottom of the list... We have, and I am so sorry to all of you Tim Burton fans, Alice in Wonderland. This might be kind of an anomaly in trends like this that the originator is, for my money, uh, the worst one. I talk about it a bit in the video, but it just it just looks so ugly. And I I know people have a lot of opinions on Tim Burton. I think people tend to agree whether you're a fan of him or not that this movie is kind of where he starts like his decline. I think there's some people who would probably argue that it's before that. I'm not versed in his entire filmography, but I I agree. It's not that it feels uninspired. I think it feels limited by the fact that it is a remake and we're going to see more of that later in this trend. But this was like the original Disney live action remake and you can kind of see like why it kicked stuff off like or why why this was the one that they wanted to start with because you know tim burton is a director with a certain aesthetic and you know on paper like a tim burton alice in wonderland makes a lot of sense when you put those things together like that's a good match of director and subject matter i think on paper in practice, it just becomes kind of this, like, CGI mess. And I, I rewatched, or I don't know if I'd actually seen it before, but I watched the uh, original cartoon uh, from the 50s or whatever. And, like, there's some stuff that I don't love about it, but there's something that's really fun about just, like, the amount of care that the animators put into like just the crazy animation sequences in that movie which like we're i'm sure we're like very ambitious for the time but it holds up like there's just i i really love 2d animation like that and taking something like alice in wonderland and putting it in live action is the fact that that movie made so much money has created a lot of problems in the industry in terms of like thinking that we can and should adapt everything into live action like i'm I'm not saying that's something that should never be done but there's some things that really lend themselves well to animation that just are, are gonna look wrong in live action and I, I think this is a prime example of that the one thing i'll give this movie on like a macro scale outside of just like enjoyment is that I appreciate that they're giving Tim Burton the freedom to be himself with this. Like a lot of other Disney live action remakes seem to just like, they'll, they'll get these big name directors and then just like, I, I don't even get why. Like the, the biggest example to me, at least of the ones that I've seen is Guy Ritchie making Aladdin like, why do you want somebody like Guy Ritchie making that movie? He like they don't let him one, I think it's a bad mix of like director and subject matter. And two, 
they don't let him do anything in that movie. Like, there is not an ounce of Guy Ritchie in that movie. I don't think the same can be said for Alice in Wonderland. Like, Tim Burton gets to be Tim Burton here, maybe not in ways that we necessarily enjoy. Like, going back to something I was saying a minute ago, like, giving him, like, a ton of money to make this, it, it kind of makes sense. It's like, Alice in Wonderland is old. It's an, it's an older cartoon. It's not one from, like, the 90s, like, an Aladdin or Beauty and the Beast, which, of course, they did later. But starting off with something that's, like, if they mess this up, like, people aren't going to be that mad. Like, it's not going to necessarily ruin the original. And the the original movie, like, doesn't have much of a plot. It's just kind of, like, weird stuff happening for 80 minutes or whatever. And it kind of makes sense that, like, this remake gives it more of a traditional plot because you know just you want to make your 200 million dollar movie marketable so you know you throw a save the cat structure onto it and financially it, it worked i think it would be really interesting to see for one thing like starting off this trend with something that's rated pg and I should be more fair to them on this because they are not they were not looking to ignite a trend of gritty fairy tale movies like they did. What they were trying to do and also did successfully is create a market for Disney live action remakes. And I think you can see a lot of like the spirit of that being taken in like good and bad lessons being learned. The thing that always concerns me when something like this makes a lot of money and like has a lot of problems with it is that the studios tend to take the wrong lessons from it they don't see like if if there's criticisms of it and it makes a lot of money nobody cares about the criticisms which is why we still have stuff like minions because even if those movies aren't very good if they keep making money there's no reason to change it and i think you see the like heavily cgi and not very good looking like photorealistic renditions of these things that were made for 2d animation and then trying to make them look like grounded in some kind of reality and like you know making the cheshire cat look kind of like a real cat is it just it doesn't look very good but they kind of you you keep seeing that kind of imagery and that approach to like visual effects characters in the rest of that the disney live action remakes so i'll probably talk about those a little bit more because i think they're like pretty closely tied to this trend but seeing as like this was the origin point you can see how it's kind of the rosetta stone for both of these trends and it does disappoint me i think like i i would really like to have seen something that like i think it's a i think it creates a, a few problems that we see throughout this trend one is that it's remaking another movie it's not a direct adaptation of like the lewis carroll story it's a remake of the disney thing so it's beholden to that more than anything else and that really limits like the amount that i think it feels free to like play around with the source material and reframe it and it also kind of locks in the audience as like the Disney movie is a kid's movie, so this has to be too. So we have to make it PG, and, like, we're going to make it feel a little bit edgy. We're going to get, like, a goth 19-year-old or however old Mia Wasikowski was for that movie. Like, give her the, like, Tim Burton protagonist look and have Tim Burton do all of his things. That's kind of more for, like, older audiences. But then we're also going to, like package it so that we can still get like six-year-olds to come and see this because it's it's a disney thing and that i think is a problem that carries through certainly every disney produced movie in this trend but even into some other ones so that kind of went a little bit outside of the actual alice in wonderland movie but like i mentioned all of it because the disney live action trend is like the kind of other offshoot of 
this trend. Like, it, they sort of ran in parallel to each other, and ultimately the Disney remake one beat out this gritty trend. So I think it is kind of important, and I do this a bit in the main video, to, like, compare where those two trends are different. Because one has become massively successful and the other has pretty much died at this point. But anyway, we'll leave that there. Alice in Wonderland, number 12. I do not enjoy it. Number 11 is Jack the Giant Slayer. What I really hate most about it is just, like, the soul or lack thereof. I've seen this in a few trends that I've looked at. Some, or well, I mean, I've only done two videos so far, but there's some that I've been watching movies for and am a long way from actually making the videos for. But there's a thing that I see in, like, later stages of a lot of these trends where you just get the sense that, like, nobody actually wanted to make this movie. Like, it is just... It is made with, like, the sole purpose of this thing is trendy right now. How do we, like, capitalize on it? The one that's coming to mind as a comparison is Gods of Egypt. As, like, I, I really don't think anybody wanted that movie to exist. Like, anyone, anyone in, like, a major creative position on that movie just, like, didn't care. Like, everyone was there for a paycheck. That that can be true of stuff that, like, still turns out okay, but when it's, like, when that's the, like, mindset at every stage, you, you, it's gonna show. And I, I, I don't want to say that to, like, fault people who worked on this. Like, I'm sure there was, like, a lot of work that people are proud of that went into this. Um, I, I've worked on a couple of things that, like, I don't really care that much about the end product, but I can still take pride in my work, and I like to think that people and i'm saying that for like day jobs that i've done like outside of stuff for this channel or my own creative projects like i, I we can still celebrate the work that people did with on projects like this because i'm sure there was a lot of good work that went into it that said at the core of it it just feels soulless like it feels like a product i can imagine somebody having fun with it but like Truly, I think the only time of life that I would have enjoyed this is if I was, like, 11. I compare it in the video to Pirates of the Caribbean. Like, I think that's what it's trying to be. And it it just doesn't have that, like, special magic that, like, made those movies great. It doesn't have, like, Gore Verbinski's vision. And, like, as much as Johnny Depp has become a parody of himself, like, he's really freaking good. And those first two Pirates, and first three Pirates movies, really. And you don't have something like that in Jack the Giant Slayer. It's just got, like, nothing going for it. And doesn't seem... We'll, we'll see this a couple more times, too. It doesn't seem like anybody was like, Hey, I have a good idea of how to, like, make Jack the Giant Slayer. Or, like, make a cool, edgy Jack and the Beanstalk movie. It just feels like somebody pulled like a fairy tale out of a hat and I was like, all right, let's go make this, make it PG-13 and uh, again, like just slap a save the cat formula onto it. I mentioned in the video, like it, it's just Aladdin. Like if you actually take the plot of the movie, like there's so many things that are just like somebody basically copy pasted Aladdin and put some ugly CGI giants in there. And man, it's, it wastes a good cast. But like, un unlike Alice in Wonderland, there's no like, you know, Brian Singer I don't think is known for his style. At this point, he's known for being canceled for, I forget exactly what he was canceled for, but it was bad. I don't feel any of Brian Singer in this from like his other movies of his that I've seen, which is like fine, but... I compare something like this also to something like where an auteur director like is really indulgent, like a like a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or like uh, Avatar: The Way of Water. I don't like either of those movies, but I can at least feel in them that like Tarantino and Cameron are making exactly the movie they want to make. They they're making really weird choices that I don't agree with, but 
there's at least like a creative vision there that you can't really deny. And I'm not saying that makes them more enjoyable. In a way, like the, the freedom that they have makes me critique them harder. But there's at least a soul to them in a way that like all the weird and like lame choices that are made in this movie, it, it doesn't feel like that's a creative vision. It feels like just nobody cared. And they were just like, screw it, let's let's put that in there. It'll probably make money anyway. Which ultimately that specifically didn't. But like it always kind of saddens me when I come across something like that. Because like and, and that was that was the thing that really surprised me about this trend too that I don't think I really got into in the main video is like, I didn't expect any of these to be that good, but I kind of expected more of them to be like, at least somebody's like going for it and like trying to give us like some of the, at like pure genre aesthetics and enjoyment. I'm kind of spoiling one of the later ones, but like Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters is what I expected there to be more of. Like something that wasn't necessarily good, but at least, like, you can tell people are having fun with it. And that's not what Jack the Giant Slayer is. So moving on from that to number 10 is uh, Alice Through the Looking Glass. And I'll say, these bottom three, like, are close to interchangeable. Like, I don't enjoy any of these. This also feels really soulless. Like, y you take Tim Burton away from it, and that's fine. I, I don't feel like it made it better or worse, noticeably. But it ends up just kind of looking like a lot of the other Disney live-action remakes of the time, where it's, like, a lot more colorful. Like, it's not as drab as the first one, which I think reduces, like, the grittiness. It, it feels a lot more like a kid's movie. You, like, your mileage may vary on which one you prefer. I, I kind of just think they're both bad. And this one doesn't even have the, like... I guess you'd call it, like, novelty of the first one, if we want to use that word. I don't really have a lot to say on this one, so I'm probably going to just move on from it. But, like, it is another example of just, like, something that nobody really wanted to make it, I don't think. And that's a shame, too, because, like, the world of this story is, like, really fantastical and, like, could have some just crazy imagery in it, and, like, does in the cartoon and in both movies but it doesn't feel like you like I, I feel like Taika Waititi before he kind of like got swallowed up by like making Marvel and Star Wars movies he might have been somebody who like could have been a really good creative pairing for this or again Gore Verbinski I think it has a style that like could mesh really well with this, where it's just like, we're going to do some weird shit for, a, like, part of this, because that's kind of what this movie is. And I, I wish they could have taken that route with it instead of trying to, like, go for mainstream appeal with it. Granted, I, I will admit, that probably wouldn't have been as profitable for them and, like, would have been more distancing. But then again, like, I think Barbie is weird, in a way that, like, this movie could have been, where you just kind of have this, like, bonkers story world and don't bother explaining a lot of the logic or lack thereof to it. So, like, I think there is now some evidence that maybe, like, audiences have some kind of tolerance for it. It's just too bad because, like, I think there's a lot of creative opportunity for something like that. But when there's so much money behind it, like you get a studio that's making really safe choices, which I, I can kind of sympathize with, but it I, I feel like it does really dilute the product. Uh, moving on to a very different uh, example than the others we've talked about. At number nine, I have Beastly. This almost should have been an honorable mention because it's like present day and is just like a, it's a retread of Beauty and the Beast in like 2011, America, I think it's in New York. This is just like peak camp. It reminded me a lot of like a combination of like the few Disney Channel original movies that I've seen, which is very few. I think I've seen like I I babysat some kids watching Zapped and then like Cloud Nine. So take take that comparison with a grain of salt. But it it like reminds me of a combination of that and 
10 things I hate about you where we're making these like pretty obvious homages to the original story. And there's, there's an assumption that you know what it is. Like, let me draw back on that. 10 things I hate about you works if you have no idea that it's a Shakespeare adaptation. Like that can just be a story about four high schoolers that are getting up to some hijinks and like making bets that like, oh, you can't date Julia Stiles or whatever, or like do that so I can, however the um, setup works in that movie. Like you can just take that at face value and you might have no idea that it's like based off of The Taming of the Shrew uh, from Shakespeare. Beastly, I feel like doesn't have that where it's like, if you don't know that it's Beauty and the Beast and you like somehow don't know that story, it's not going to make any freaking sense to you. It's just going to be weird. And it's kind of weird anyway, but at least it can fall back on like we are homaging and like riffing on this story that you know. It's a little bit more like the other kinds of like riffing on fairy tales that we'd already had. I, I included it here because it does feel like it's trying for an older audience, even though that like if we want to use the word older i think in this case it means like 12 and 13 year olds like this does not feel like it's made at all for adults it's it's very much like a teen movie in its whole like vibe and aesthetic and casting and general everything it, it feels like it's trying to be like a little bit clever like that like you know this story but we're doing it like different now i think there was like a lot of that i, I mentioned a bunch of it in the video like you have Shrek, Hoodwinked, Enchanted, all that kind of stuff, Princess and the Frog. I didn't mention this, but um, in the early days of this trend in like, uh, I think it was seventh grade, so probably like 2012, I got an assignment to write a riff on a fairy tale. Like that was like a thing we did in English class. I, I don't remember if I mentioned that in the video, but like, beastly feels like an a plus version of that assignment of like take and like literally it was made like a year before i got this assignment like we could have watched it as like a companion piece to that uh, or like an example um to go off of because at the time i guess it would have only been alice in wonderland and that that had come out oh and uh red riding hood i guess so, like, that's kind of the vibe that this gives. I made the mistake of watching this one alone. I, I think I did that with all of them, actually, because I didn't want to put anyone else through it. I, I think, like, if you're into camp, it can be fun. Like, it could be a good, like, watch this tipsy with your friends kind of movie. Or, like, in context of this podcast, it would make a good watch along, I think. That's, like, the pitch I'll give it. If you're watching it alone and sober and having to pay attention like I was... It's not that good of a time. Like, there's a couple things to laugh at, but a lot of it's just kind of cheesy and lame. Like, it, I, I double checked to make sure it wasn't like a direct to TV movie. I, I think it wasn't. I think it got it, it made some money, so like, I think it got some kind of theatrical release. Now that would be straight to Netflix, and like, not one that they would give a lot of fanfare to. Number eight, same year, 2011, uh, Red Riding Hood. I expected more from this one. Uh, I must say. I, I thought this was going to be, like, one of the most, like, epitomized versions of this trend where it's like, all right, you take a really simple story and, like, build out upon it. You can do, like, fun little call-outs, but then, like, kind of make the story your own. And in a sense, they do that, but, like, I, I, I mentioned this in the video, and this is truly, like, my biggest critique of it. It doesn't feel like it wants to be a Red Riding Hood movie. I kind of said this about, like, Jack the Giant Slayer. It feels like somebody in a, like, executive's office said, okay, Twilight's making it big. Alice in Wonderland's taking it big. Let's get the director of Twilight, get the girl from Mean Girls. We'll, like, do a dark Twilight-esque version of Red Riding Hood. And that pitch makes a lot of sense in 2011. Like, if you look at the amount of money, like, what was making money back then, it makes all the sense in the world. Um, and they made their money back. So I, I can't really fault them for that. Creatively, like, you, you can just feel, again, like, 
it's not as egregious as Jack the Giant Slayer in this regard, but you can really feel that like this is just trying to jump on the trend of like we're gonna create this love triangle and then not really do that much with it. We're not even gonna like do the basic beats of the Red Riding Hood story. Like the fact that they make the wolf a werewolf, I think, is like one telling that like they're trying to jump on the twilight bandwagon and two like doing that just like fundamentally changes the red riding hood story it almost like shouldn't count as an adaptation at that point and i don't mind like at face value i don't mind that they're like making that big of a change it's a pretty thin story also hoodwinked existed already at that point and that also has to like build upon the i, I think they it's been years since I saw that movie, but I think they get through the original fairy tale in all of, like, 15 minutes at most. Because it's, you know, it's a story you can tell your kid in five minutes before bed. So obviously they should have expanded it, but it feels like nobody really wanted to do it. It would have been better as, like, just something that somebody wanted to make. Again, like, I watch it and I'm like, what was the inspiration here? I kind of said this about, like, Lucy when we talked about it. Like, I can't tell what drew the director to it. Like, did you just want to make, like, a really down-the-middle genre movie and that's it? Because that's all this really is. Like, I can't even sense that, like, you wanted to do, like, a certain visual aesthetic or some part of this story compelled you. Like, everything feels so half-assed in it that I, I can't even really tell what they're prioritizing it it just feels very like slapped together to give beastly some credit here like i i enjoyed red riding hood a little bit more but to give beastly credit it knows what it wants to be and i don't think red riding hood does and i think we can say that about some later or some ones that i'll get to later as well but it's, it's disappointing because i i think like this could have been a fun campy time maybe it could have been legit good like i don't know of a better pitch for like making a gritty red riding hood movie but it could have at least been grittier like that's another thing that i mentioned in the video is like they're not a lot of these aren't even that aggressive about how gritty they're being and that was what i that was a surprise for me because that's what i thought most of these were going to be from like the impression i'd gotten of them just through like the little bit of like pop culture osmosis knowledge that i had before watching these Okay, so moving on to number seven, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. So this is the last one in this trend, uh, at least for the moment. I I talk about it in the video. It has the same problem as the first one, which I'll talk about later. And it's kind of what I was talking about with Alice in Wonderland before, where, like, half of it feels like it's trying to be this, like, edgier fantasy movie with, like, big battle scenes and like sort of grotesque creatures but then you have like professor umbridge and what's her name juno temple from a uh, ted lasso you have them just like being this like comic relief sideshow that like just doesn't mix well it doesn't even mix in like a way that like mary and pippin are kind of off doing their own thing in lord of the rings and like making little jokes like it they're going like two extreme kids movie with one and like trying for like two extreme dark fantasy vibes with the other it, the, the darker element is tempered because you know they got to keep a pg rating and keep it disney which again i think like really limits it if you want to tell a maleficent story and like really go hard with that i i feel like you can't be limited to the Sleeping Beauty story in in the way that they are. Or at least, like, feel like you have to get the same audience that's going to be the same kids that, like, their parents are going to put on the cartoon for them just to, like, shut them up while they're making dinner. Like, if you want that crowd, you got to give up the, like... You, you either got to give up that crowd or you got to give up the gritty, dark aesthetic. And they kind of do neither which I think is to the movie's detriment. And I I don't know if there's, like, any basis in, like, 
a sequel to Sleeping Beauty like this. Like this, this one kind of is. It's not entirely unique because Snow White and the Huntsman is or uh, Huntsman and Winter's War kind of falls under this too, which is spoilers, but next on the list. They kind of both have this identity of being a sequel to something that doesn't have a sequel. Like, there's no lore behind it, and, you know, Maleficent dies at the end of the original Sleeping Beauty, so, like, there's nothing else to her character to base it off of. Yeah, so this one is... On the whole, like, pretty bland to me, it, which is, is true of most of these. Like, it, it's a Disney live-action remake, and it, it has, like, most of the hallmarks of that. The, the difference here is that it's a sequel, and it's not really beholden to, like, anything uh, that the original does. It, it does do something that has, like, been a very prevalent trend in those remakes, especially of, like the more classic princess movies which is we're gonna like be very clear about how long the princess and the prince are waiting to get married in this we're gonna make it very clear that like more years have passed i'm kind of stealing that point from Lindsay ellis's videos about the uh live action remakes but this is a a pretty prime example of that um it just kind of takes place across two movies i think there might be a third that ends up happening i'm sure it'll probably just be about the same as these okay going to the next one huntsman winter's war i don't think i have much to say about this that i didn't in the video like a sequel to this could have been good i mentioned that it's like basically live action frozen in a lot of ways and i wish that wasn't the approach that they took like Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, it feels like a very down-the-middle kind of approach to this sort of movie. It's like, all right, slap a pretty basic plot structure on a fantasy action movie. And, like, the only thing that really carries over from the first movie is that you have the Huntsman coming back and then Charlize Theron as the Evil Queen comes back. So they kind of had the freedom to do it. Oh, also... um. A couple of the dwarves uh, come back. Nick Frost is one of them. Yeah, like, I I wish it was better. The cast, like, Emily Blunt, I said it I, I said it in the video, I'll say it again here. You got Emily Blunt, Jessica Chastain, and Charlize Theron in a movie together. Like, that is an insanely good trio of actors. And you, you give them, like, this, like, middest of all mid-movies. We just, we need a redo somehow, like somehow just get the three of them in a room together and I don't know, pair them with like somebody competent, somebody interesting, get one of the directors I listed at the end of the movie, like put them in like Damien Chazelle or Barry Jenkins in a room together and just like see what they come up with. I, I, I'd pay to see it. They tend to pick good projects a lot of times and that kind of star power just went to waste so disappointing um and again like it doesn't go very hard with the gritty aesthetic which also disappointing number five we have maleficent uh the original uh this one i feel like i can say there was some kind of creative vision behind it like again it feels like that assignment i was given in middle school of like take a fairy tale and put a twist on it like, okay, we're going to tell Sleeping Beauty from the villain's perspective. And I, I think this, again, like, it suffers from that tonal thing of, like, we want it to be edgy, but we got to make this PG because, like, we want to make more money. We want it to be part of the Disney brand. Again, it, it made a crazy amount of money and got a sequel, so can't really blame them. They, they kind of got something right with it. The fact that they have to still put Aurora to sleep, but then, like, are also creating this adoptive parent narrative with Maleficent, like, coming to care for her, and, like, I don't know, it's not, like, a literal adoption at the end, but it, it might as well be. It just creates this problem where, like, she's super vindictive and, like, is cursing this child at the beginning and then is, like, uh 
Maybe I shouldn't have done that two scenes later. Granted, in narrative time, that's like 16 years worth of time that she, like, I'm not saying that that's inconsistent for, like, a human to go on a an arc like that in that kind of time. In the amount of time we spend with it in the movie, it's, like, maybe 15 minutes. Like, it's not even the full second act. If, like, if that's your story, you gotta, like, spend more time on that, I think. It, I I felt like that. I'm, I'm... It seems like a lot of people are fine with it. I think it felt very rushed, and, like, the the main thing that I see getting in the way of it is that it has... It feels like it has to also still kind of be Sleeping Beauty. Like, you gotta get the prince in there because it's Sleeping Beauty, and you gotta get the fairies in there because it's Sleeping Beauty. It, it feels like it's kind of at war with itself. Again, I really think that, like, if something that wasn't... Alice in Wonderland, like, wasn't a Disney live-action remake, was the beginning of this trend, the origin, then we could have had more freedom to, like, not be adapting, like, it's, again, it's not an, an adaptation of the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale. It's an adaptation of the Sleeping Beauty Disney movie. And that, I feel like, is really limiting it in some important ways. But they made a lot of money, and uh, like I said in the video, that's got the best ratings uh, from Letterboxd and IMDb, like the best audience ratings. So, like, and I will admit, it works. Like, it's mid, but it works. So I, I can't fault it as hard as some of the others. And, you know, it's in the upper half of this. Uh, number four is Mirror Mirror. This also feels like it could have been like an A-plus version of the assignment that I got in middle school of just like, you know, it's Snow White, but with kind of a twist. And they kind of like play pretty fast and loose with like, we're going to be Snow White, but different, right? Because this is different. And then, no, we're going to be Snow White straight away. Like, I mentioned it in the segment on this movie in the video but like the fact that you open it's it's so baffling to me that like they open the movie with julia roberts doing a voiceover of like i'm the evil queen and this is my story not snow white's and then they have her at the end say well psych no it's snow white's story the whole time so i'm like okay wh what the hell are you what do you want this to be the much better, like, version of that is we're going to tell you Snow White straight ahead and then spend the rest of the movie subverting that and being like, it's like, this was my story the whole time. Like, that might actually have been a cool approach. Instead, it's like, it's telling you up front, like, here we go, it's going to be different this time. No, we actually just gave you the same thing as before. I feel like there's a food comparison I can make, but it's not coming to mind. Like, at face value, if you're talking, like, whose story is it, like, it does stick to that, I think. Like, it it, it really is still Snow White's story. And they tell it, like, pretty down the middle. But, again, with that, like, Princess and the Frog enchanted kind of twist on it. Where, like, or, or even, like, Frozen, where, like, we're gonna put, like, a 2010s sensibility on this story. The positive for this outside of, like, you know, I still don't think it's, like, fantastic, but it at least is not limited by the thing I was talking about before of, like, this is, like, it is an adaptation of Snow White. It is not an adaptation of the Disney cartoon Snow White. You can still feel, like, that influence, but they don't have, like, the dwarves be named Grumpy and Happy and Doc. Like, they have their own names. You kind of have, like, a different dynamic between the Evil Queen and Snow White. Like, it's a little more, like, uh, tangled, where, like, Snow White is being, like, super sheltered by the Queen and, like, has no experience of the outside world. Despite all of that, the thing I'm always going to remember this movie for is Army Hammer doing, like, almost cannibal things in it. I I had a lot of fun and did a lot of extra work 
to get the uh, little supercut that I made in the video of like him sniffing and licking people. Um, some of those clips were not easy to find. Uh, I, I do think it was worth it because like just holy crap does it feel like this was like army hammer discovering that he is a cannibal i don't know for sure that that's true that's how it reads so that's mirror mirror number three getting to the top of the list here is pan uh which surprised me like this is definitely the most actually i don't want to say it's the most like four kids coded but it is brighter i'd say both like visually and tonally than the like pg disney remakes like maleficent and alice in wonderland like those at least try to give some kind of like darkness to it i i kind of wonder if this was trying to like set up a sequel and peter pan's been like remade a couple times but you know you have hook which i haven't seen and i think they did like some kind of live action version in like 2003 or something i feel like i remember watching part of that as a kid there's some really wild choices that are made in this like i feel like the approach they took to this like is a little closer to what i might have wanted for alice in wonderland granted like peter pan is a little bit more of like a grounded story come to think of it i haven't read this book i don't think i ever reread it but Peter and the Star Catchers is a pretty fun, like, Peter Pan origin story. And it, like, really embraces being a pirate story. I, I think they I think they had a trilogy of it, and there might have been, like, an, another spin-off book that I didn't read. I feel like that could have been a good adaptation and maybe maybe better than what we got here. But it's at least, like, doing some ambitious things with that world. It flopped super hard, so obviously didn't really pay off for them. And I don't know if I want to say that that's like a really disappointing thing. I'm, I'm not surprised. Like, this isn't like oh, some hidden gem, like, y'all didn't support this. I don't think it, like, deserved that kind of love. But, I mean, clearly based on my ranking, I, I think it's a lot better than a lot of these. And I think it's too bad we didn't, like, I think this would have been a better starting point for this trend like if we had if pan had come out in 2010 and made a billion dollars i think the trend might still be going and like could have gone to some more interesting places the drawback of that is it is again like very much a kid's movie but i think if you like took more of this approach and made it for adults like peter pan is the wrong fairy tale to do that with but if you take more of this approach i like that better at least the only other thing i would i want to shout out well okay i'll mention again with this like it's still really weird that they have smells like teen spirit and blitzkrieg bop be songs that characters in the movie sing like not just the background music truly one of the strangest music choices ever the other thing i want to call out is I really enjoyed, I think I shouted out um, Hugh Jackman and Rooney Mara in the in the video because they, I, I like that they commit to their performances and those are also just two actors that I really like. A lesser known actor who I think also, and like less featured in it, one of Blackbeard's henchmen is played by Nonzo Inosi. I hope I'm saying that name right. I'll, I'll try to put a picture of him up here, but if he looks familiar, it's because he's uh, Zara Zohan Daxos on Game of Thrones from uh, season two. He's uh, he's in uh, an early like Daenerys storyline. I think he, I think he's from Karth is the name. It's like late season two. I'll, I'll have to check back. Maybe I did shout him out in the video, but I I just wanted to shout out his performance because like. I feel like he just made that character a lot more memorable than some than that type of role usually is. Like the two things I've seen him, he's a really solid actor that I think could be, you know, if he gets the right role, could be good. So I'll I'll shout him out as I can. I might rewatch this one someday. Uh, this is the first one I will say that of. I still think it's like far from its peak potential. It's decent. I, I this is. <laughs> 
it, it's kind of telling that so the bottom of this list the like the bottom three i rated um two or one and a half out of five stars on letterbox so i'll link to the list uh in the show notes the top three are two and a half stars and then everything else is two stars. I, I don't really... Some of these, I think on a rewatch, I might move these top two, the next ones, to three stars. Like, they're kind of borderline. But, like, nothing in this trend is great uh, for my money. So, but, like like I said, I might rewatch Pan someday. As well as these last two that we'll get to. So, number two is Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. This is more of what I thought this trend would be. Um, again, only R-rated movie in this trend, which is a shame, because if you're making gritty adaptations of fairy tales, like, you should at least, like... Like, I feel like at minimum, you should take the approach that this one does. Like, I I was expecting stuff like this to be, like, the worst of it. Actually, that's not true. I was expecting the Disney remakes to be the worst of it um and they were for the other stuff i was expecting a lot more of this where like they're gonna like put a little bit of like a fairy tale skin on top of like a fun campy action movie i hesitate to praise this one too much because i think like it does sort of run into some of the critique i was giving earlier of like did tommy Warcola really want to make a hansel and gretel movie I, I can't really say that I get that sense from this. I do think he made the movie he wanted to make. Like, I've I've since... I don't know if I saw it before or after. But uh, I've seen one other movie of his, Violent Night. Which is like a... Uh, it's a Christmas movie that, like, has David Harbour as Santa. Like, it has Santa doing a Die Hard. It, it's pretty explicit about that. But I feel like that movie is made with, like, a lot of love for, like, Home Alone and Die Hard and Christmas movies in general. And, like, you, you feel that come through. Like, when I was talking about how, like, Jack the Giant Slayer is soulless, this movie is not soulless. Like, Tommy Warcola brings a, like, creative voice to this. It's a pretty, like, lowbrow, campy one, but it's a good time for 90 minutes. If you're looking for like a turn your brain off type deal and like if this trend ever comes back like i feel like this should be the floor if you're not going to take it seriously fine but then do it like this like give us some genre fun with it and i, I think like he made the movie he wanted to make and it is kind of fun it's ridiculous in some places i talk about the like technology of this world which is just so baffling the fact that it's a fairy tale movie and like hansel and gretel are using shotguns and tasers and machine guns is just wild and shows like like that that i think is the thing that betrays that like tommy workola didn't want to make a hansel and gretel movie like somebody probably told him like we want to jump on this trend make us a gritty fairy tale and he was like sure i'm just gonna make a shoot up action movie that i want to make but i'll I'll, I'll make it Hansel and Gretel, sure. I, I don't think he would have taken that project uh, if it wasn't 2013 and we hadn't just gotten Snow White and the Huntsman and Alice in Wonderland. This one's a good time, which I can't really say for most of the others. And coming in at number one is Snow White and the Huntsman. Uh, so this was the only movie I had seen prior to going and watching stuff for this trend video i i saw this when i was like 13 i think like a little after it came out i think i enjoyed it well enough as like a 13 year old it was like a fun action movie i still enjoyed it watching it last year for this like it again is like what i expected this trend to be like i i love that it actually commits to like we are gonna be a gritty fairy tale movie like i won't rehash too many of the points that i made in the video but it's like again this movie knows what it wants to be and it, it really disappointed me that the sequel didn't carry any of that spirit into it and they were just like all right we're gonna make a super down the middle basic sequel to this and not really take any of the like aesthetic like i like that it's so dingy and um again like like mirror mirror I think it ascends above some of these other ones because 
It is not a remake of Snow White the cartoon, although they call it out in... They, like, lightly call it out. There was a clip that I wasn't able to find for the video where one of the dwarves says, like, it's off to work we go as they're, like, they're, like, wading through a sewer of, like, wastewater. I, I feel like that's kind of the undertone. Like, I, I did that little um, montage, like, with the metal music and the announcer voice in, um, the, like, the trailer announcer voice in the video where it's, like, Every reference we're going to make to the cartoon is showing, like, how we're trying to, like, one-up it by being, like, angstier and darker than the cartoon. So I feel like that's, like, its only relationship to it, and otherwise it is doing its own thing. Again, it's a pretty, like, basic story structure. They're not doing that much that's, like, super interesting with the, um, like, Snow White story they're not like doing any kind of reframing of it to speak of again i think there's some twilight influence here like you have a bit of a love triangle with the huntsman and the prince most obvious twilight influence you've got Kristen stewart there in the lead role i had a good time with this one like there's a reason it's on the top of my list it's still like three stars out of five at best the fact that it knows what it wants to be and commits to it goes a long way. And it looks kind of good. I didn't know this until doing research. It got nominated for a visual effects Oscar. Didn't win. But, like, I, I think it's deserved. Like, there's some good-looking VFX in this movie. Especially for, like, 2012 era. I think it might have felt a little bit more, like, of that current aesthetic. But I like that better. Maybe, maybe this is just a nostalgia thing. But I like that, like, dark, dirty, gritty aesthetic that this movie has a lot better than what we see in, like, the later movies of this trend, where it is more of that, like, mid to late 2010s, very obviously green screen backgrounds, like, CGI color-corrected creatures. Like, I shouldn't say color-corrected as if that, like encapsulates it because i i'm sure there's heavy color correction going on with this too but like in this in in snow white and the huntsman they like turn down the saturation and like make everything closer to like grayscale in most cases whereas in the other ones in including the sequel they like scale up the contrast like it has a much more digital look to it this might just be a me thing i personally enjoy what this movie does a lot more especially for what this trend is and what this movie is trying to be so that's the end of the ranking i wanted to also take this time to just make like a couple of small points that i i didn't get to in the main video one is um i talked to a friend about this one and i i saw she had like a bunch of these movies um that she had like seen them on on her letterbox profile and when I say that, I think it might have been, like, seven. I, I, I had a couple of friends that I reached out to that I just, like, saw that they had also seen a lot of them. Nobody had seen all, uh, which probably a good thing. I wouldn't recommend that anyone do what I did with this trend and watch all of them just for curiosity's sake. Plus, I did that for you. You don't have to now. You can just watch these two videos um, and get basically the sense of it. Save yourself a lot of time. But anyway... A point that she made with it, um, one was that it's like a very white feminism heavy trend, which I I don't think I'm educated enough in feminism to do that kind of examination, but like, yeah, it's there if only because like, there's a lot of like, white women in like, girl boss kind of uh, portrayals in this, which... I'm not saying that as a critique. I, I think that's, like, it's, it's kind of of the 2010s. And I think it's a better version of it than we tend to get in, like, especially some of the later, like, live-action remakes. It feels less disingenuous, I guess. Less, um, they're not calling it out as heavily. I would like to see somebody make that video also, like, looking at this. And... She also, the other point she made was that this is like a very Tumblr uh, aesthetic inspired 
trend. And again, that's something that I like vaguely agree with. The only reason I can't agree with it harder is because I, I was never on Tumblr. Um, I kind of have a sense of what she means by Tumblr aesthetic. I'm limited in how much I can agree to that. But it does feel like, especially the like Red Riding Hood, I feel like falls the most into that where it's like the trailer for that movie and the movie itself is like, we're going to give you just sort of vibes of a thing. Like it, it, it felt like it was made for like that early 2010s, like hot topic alt culture kind of thing. Like people who wore Thrasher t-shirts, almost like goth punk skater kids. It's like, this is fairy tales for you guys. Again, I don't think they really delivered on that, but I think that's who they were going for, especially in some of the like more teenage geared movies in this trend. I didn't make that like a point in it because I couldn't really extrapolate on it, um, but I, I wanted to mention it here because I think it is valid and maybe some of you can agree with that a little harder than I can. The only other thing I wanted to mention is something that just has happened in the months between making the original video and making this is I've seen, uh, we're getting a Wicked movie this year. Uh, in, I think like, I think it's next month. It's a Thanksgiving release. And I, I have not seen Wicked. I have a vague knowledge of it from uh, my sisters listening to the uh, cast recording. We had a, like a CD of it growing up, so I know some of the songs. But I rewatched, I watched the trailer uh, for it before recording this just to refresh my memory. And I do wonder if it has the potential to reignite this trend. I hope that if it does, like there's something else that comes in as like the one-two punch. So like the thing about it is, for one thing, Wizard of Oz is like not exactly a fairy tale, but it certainly has the trappings and aesthetics of one to the point that it, it kind of might as well be. I, I, I'd, I'd actually hazard to say it's about as much of a fairy tale as like Alice in Wonderland is. And there's certainly been a decent amount of like Wizard of Oz inspired things that have like you, you've got the Wiz, you've got Oz Great and Powerful, which come to think of it, I don't know if that should have been on here. It didn't seem gritty enough. I'm sure a bunch of things have like parodied it. Um, and Wicked's like the the most prominent example of that, where like it's taking, as far as I can tell, a very similar approach to Maleficent, where it's like we're gonna tell you the traditional story, but from like with an origin story for the bad guy. From what I can tell, I, I, I should mention I forgot Wicked is also a book uh, originally. I remember my mom read the book and like described it to me when I was like much younger. I don't know how old. I think it could reignite this trend potentially if like one if it makes enough money that that's the primary thing that certainly looks like there's a lot of money being put into it and hollywood is really weird about musicals like they've been making a decent amount of them i feel like over the past few years but they're always like really afraid to signal that anything is a musical especially outside of like disney cartoons like they can they can show us that like frozen's gonna be a musical but in the heights they have to be like kind of cagey about it um mama mia i feel like that like because apparently musicals don't sell well like that was a, a thing like even before i found out how bad the mulan remake was i was hearing about how like they're gonna cut out all the songs from it because apparently like musicals don't do well overseas and they really wanted to get, like, uh, a lot of the Chinese audience for that movie, uh, apparently unsuccessfully in the end. But I think that's, like, if, if we're talking trends, musicals is the trend that Wicked is certainly more prominently a part of, like, adaptation of a Broadway musical. Um, Tick, Tick, Boom is another example. We, we've we talked about that one on the podcast. I think that's going to be a bigger one. Also, like, we're kind of, as a... I'm, I'm recording this the weekend that uh, Joker 2 comes out, which is a, a musical, and there's a lot of discourse that I've been seeing about that. I haven't seen the movie yet, so I'm not going to weigh in. But I think 
we might be kind of in for a one-two punch of like what's the future of musicals between like the success and discourse around Joker 2 and Wicked. So maybe maybe this trend will come back as a like R-rated musical uh, fairy tale adaptations. Or at least it, it could start there. I, I kind of gave my pitch of what I want from this trend, which is like not necessarily big budgets, but like get some interesting directors to just like make some weird creative choices. Some of them won't work. Like get A24 on the, like all those like indie studios, A24, Annapurna, Blumhouse, even could join in with this, um, Neon film for like all those ones that make like those mid-budget like weird movies where they give alex garland or david eggers i'm really just saying a24 at this point but like give those directors 20 to 50 million dollars and let them just go make some weird stuff and there's a chance that i think wicked could kick that off i think it's a, a safe choice I think it rings a bit of Alice in Wonderland. 2024 is obviously a much different time. It looks a lot better. It looks like they're going for a much more cohesive and like just nice aesthetic. I I like that at least there's some diverse casting in it. Um, just from the trailer, like you know you have Cynthia Erivo playing the Wicked Witch. Um, Michelle Yeoh is there. Bowen Yang is there. Those are the faces I recognized at least. I don't want to be too hopeful about that and hope that it's, like, good representation, but it, I think it might be a safe hope that it's at least not, like, poorly done, uh, diverse representation. That gives me at least some kind of hope that, like, if this trend comes back, maybe we can get some, like, voices in here that are not, like, just straight white people, which very much seems to be the, like, I, I mentioned it in the main video, like, that is very much the angle that all of these movies were made from, and I think it's fine if we get some straight white creators in there, they can still make some good versions of it. I, I really think this trend would benefit from getting some more diverse voices and uh, in, in front and behind of the camera, but especially behind the camera. I feel like I should measure my expectations with, like, hoping that Wicked sends this, like, reignites this trend in the direction that I want. The cynical side of me says that it is probably going to be a lot closer to the, like, Disney live-action remakes than it is to, like, The Green Knight. Uh, it's definitely not going to be The Green Knight. Uh, it's probably going to be a very down-the-middle adaptation of musical there might be some things that they retrofit. I'll have to hear from other people because I'm not familiar with the original. Maybe I should listen to the audiobook in the meantime. Or, like, pick up a copy at, like, my library or something. Because I'm definitely not dropping any money to go see a performance of it. I'm, I, I just wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about that because if the future of this trend... Like, if, if it could be brought back by anything right now... I think it would be, I think Wicked would be the start of that. I think it will also take a couple things beyond Wicked, and it's going to require some studio to take a decent risk, and it's going to, that risk is going to need to pay off. I, th I think that all of those things have to happen. Like, my dream for this is Wicked makes enough money that people are like, hmm, Maybe we can bring back, like, this kind. And that, like, it maybe does some things that are a little edgy, which I don't think is going to happen, but it'd be nice. Like, if you could get enough success behind that with, like, something that has a big budget, and then A24 puts out, like, a really good and weird and successful take on, like, Sleeping Beauty or The Three Little Pigs. Probably not Sleeping Beauty because we've got two Maleficents at this point, but like something like Rumpelstiltskin or The Three Pigs. Something that they just let... I, I, I feel like I keep 
using this name, but like David Eggers, from what I know him, mean, he's not my favorite director, but he feels like a guy who could just make something super weird and like it could potentially take off. And then from there we can get some like really interesting voices. And I don't think, I, I kind of don't want, I didn't really talk about budget when I was pitching uh, stuff at the end of the video. I don't want, the two hundred million dollar adaptations, like because we got that with these movies, and I think, I think that amount of money is is actually kind of crippling to them. I think they would be set free a lot more by, like I was saying before, like a twenty to fifty, maybe one hundred million dollar movie. Those kind of budgets, because that might lead to like, and we've seen success with that, like. Hansel and Gretel Winch Hunters was not one of the more expensive movies and it was one of the most successful in this trend in terms of like budget to gross ratio. So I'd like to see that. For better or worse, Wicked is not that movie. Uh, Wicked is, let me let me check the budget on it. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be upward of 100 million. Google is telling me... Um, 145 million for the budget for Wicked. Uh, so that's going to have to be a pretty big hit. Uh, and they're, they're putting it out in November. So, like, I'm sure there's going to be an original song in there that's not from the musical that they try to get an Oscar nomination for. And it'll probably be up for, like, some of the more technical stuff. I'm sure it's not. I don't think it's going to be Best Picture. There's actually also, this is just kind of coming to mind right now, I think there's a chance that it could be following a little bit in Barbie's footsteps in some ways. It's kind of a, like, this feels like a very cynical and corporate way to look at it, but it is a big budget, very, like, female-coded story that is, like, probably like the execs in the room are probably saying like this is going to be marketed towards women so in that sense it's going to i think from a studio perspective be lumped in a little bit with like with barbie i don't know that audiences will think the same with that but i think i think studio heads will so there's a chance that you know we've we've had a year since Barbie came out. And I think that could mean that that might be enough time that it could have influenced a few creative decisions that were made for Wicked. I really don't expect that it's going to be as weird uh, because Wicked is a direct adaptation of a pre-written story and Barbie is not. So... I don't expect that that kind of creative freedom... They're not going to have as much creative freedom as Greta Gerwig did, uh, for better or worse. But I think that's another trend that Wicked could be tied into, probably more than the gritty fairy tale one. Best case scenario, I think it, it does what I was pitching and like does kind of kick stuff off. Some of that is not going to be... That's not going to be entirely dependent on... It's financial success. It's going to largely depend on creative choices that are, I'm sure, already set in stone at this point. If I were to bet money, I would say no, they are not going to uh, give them the freedom to make like really interesting creative choices. But another idea is kind of coming to mind. I don't know if it's the one that I want because Wicked is not a movie that I, I wish failure upon. I don't think that would necessarily be good for the industry. But what I think Wicked Failing might do is it, it will probably delay, if anything, it will delay the return of the gritty fairy tale uh, movie trend, if that ever comes back at all. It will definitely put that off for a few years. But I think what it will also do is, if Wicked fails, it will limit the budget that those future movies potentially get and we will get the 20 million dollar adaptation of the three little pigs and not the 150 million dollar adaptation of rumpelstiltskin starring timothy chalamet 
or you know take your pick of like a different fairy tale and big name actor but I, I think that is where Wicked will probably influence the future of this trend the most is like if it is successful then more money is going to be put into it and if it's less successful then there is there is less that will be put into it so you know that's all speculation i think i'm going to end it here um i've gone for a while i don't know what i'll be able to cut this down to but i liked this as an experiment um i was already planning to do this uh like you know, in conjunction with this one. I'm going to do this with the big robots movies as well. I'd like to do this with other stuff too. Like, I, we don't have much of an audience at the time of uh, recording this, but, you know, if you're here and this is your first video on this channel, uh, thanks for sticking all the way through. I hope this was good for you. You should know that we mostly do not stuff like this. We do... Um, a few video essays that uh, like the gritty fairy tales one which i hope you either have already watched or will go and watch uh at this point if you made it this far and we also have uh about a hundred podcast episodes none of them are on these movies we, we didn't do one because uh, none of them were good enough to talk about or at least interesting enough for my money to talk about but i have two other hosts with this like it, it's rare that this is like one of very few times on this channel that it's just me talking alone to camera unstructured like this. Most of the time it's either like a very written video essay or it's a somewhat structured but mostly free-flowing podcast discussion between me and my co-hosts. But that said, whether you're a returning fan or a new fan, uh, I want to do more of this. So, you know, I think rankings are, are a good way to, like, get some, like, looser thoughts from me that can still be interesting. And maybe maybe this can be a way to, like, also kind of build upon what I talk about in the main video essays. I'm open to doing a lot of different stuff with this. So if you're here and you want to sound off in the comments, um, or you can join our Discord as well, that's another thing. Let me know what you want me to rank. It might require that I have to watch a lot of things that I haven't watched yet. Uh, but there's a lot of those kinds of things that I'm already planning to do for the uh, trend videos like this one, or the one that this video was inspired by or a companion to. You know, just let me know what, what, what you want to see me talk about if you do, because these are a lot easier to make than the video essays. So I'm still going to keep doing them. But uh, uh, just a few that I had in mind, I might do a ranking of all the David Fincher movies or all the Chris Nolans because those are just two directors that I've seen their whole filmography. All the Mission Impossibles, I've, I'm planning on a Mission Impossible video essay. I, I started working on that recently. I'll probably do a ranking of all that before Dead Reckoning Part 2. The Big Robots one, I, I was working on a uh, IP crossover mashup trend video and all of my progress got scrapped somehow by the fickleness of my flash drives which is part of why i did this video just because i kind of wanted to make something without having to spend all the time to rewrite and re-edit that video which i'm still gonna do but that'll be another one that i rank probably i can do pixar movies i've seen all those i could do the infinity saga but we already did an mcu tournament so i feel like that would be a little redundant for me to do that, I got most of my thoughts out in that one. Um, and I just don't care enough about the MCU. I, I kind of would want to stick, I think, more to this kind of thing. Where, like, this is a trend that nobody really talks about. And I am, like, the only person I know who's watched all of these movies. So that, that positions me a little bit uniquely. I don't know that there's anything else that quite fits that. But it's, it's sort of a hole in the, like online film discourse that is it tends to be happening especially because nobody really cares about this trend anymore so yeah anyway um do all the things like share subscribe ring the bell thank you for sticking with me and i'm looking forward to doing more of these